Today's market call is presented by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow and SoFi. Get your money right all in one app. Special day here at Risk Reversal Media. That's why you see her in stripes back from the Midwest, <laughs> Wisconsin. That's EY from SoFi. It's January 3rd. I'm going to say it to you, Elizabeth, because you are. I'm. I'm going to respect you with the with the this this greeting. <laughs> Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you too. I feel like and where's Dan, Waldo today, but in blue. Yeah, Dan knows just that's you know, hard for me to say. It, guy really does not like to say it on Jan three. I mean, <laughs> it's a Jan one. Maybe if Jan two is like the first business day, he's got that. We spent a little time on Fast Money talking about that last night. And guy actually was, you know, you had every guest actually say that to you yeah. specifically, trying to get you just to, drawing just out to a little twerk bit. me or tweak me tweak or whatever you. it is. I, you know. So, so guy, it, it's 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 the second trading day of the year. It feels a lot like 2022, doesn't it? A little bit. I mean, well, the, good, the good thing is we have Liz here to get our markets right all in one show. We're going to do that. <laughs> See what I did there? I do. So, I yeah, do. Yeah. You it. know what? Do you guys remember at the beginning of 2022? I think I said something like start selling the rips. Ooh, Stop yeah. buying the dips. Start selling the yeah, rips. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got 2022 right. I did not get 2023 right. But now that that happened. 2024, I think we're in good shape. Yeah. You know, and well. I remember pointing that out saying that, you know, for a while now, Elizabeth has been saying any rally needs to be. So, I mean, I do have a bit of a memory, as you know, Dan, but that's neither. That. Well, we're going to see how this 2022 shakes out because there's some strange things brewing. Let's go right to the rundown. And it's interesting because, you know what? Stocks and bonds are linked at the hip again. And you had this big, we're going to talk about it, had this huge move to the upside in yields earlier this morning. Now, yields have been coming off and that's coinciding with the market coming back we're going to check some charts on the airlines autos and technology and you know what dan just because elizabeth's back once we're done with our market portion of the show we're going to go off the rails a little overtime where we answer your questions so cue them up now peeps yeah stick around everybody we're going to take a little time after we get through our uh, originally scheduled programming here liz so thanks for being in the studio here um you know it is interesting guy to your point we spent some time last week with carter on the one market call that we did talking about yields talking about the tlt right so the price of that inverse to um yields or so and it, it is interesting that you had you know yields higher okay tlt lower now you have the tlt higher and yields lower that four percent level is that a thing you think that we're going to be kind of you know talking around a lot of this year because if you look at this chart of the 10-year u.s treasury yield this is a one-year chart of this thing you know it came down we all know it okay i think that the, the 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 magnitude of the move was something that very few of us have seen in this short period of time um and here we are you know that 200 day moving average guy couldn't get through it really looked like it wanted to kind of break out above that downtrend but a whole host of other things would have to happen for the 10 year yield to get back above that downtrend on its way to four and a quarter, maybe four and a half. And things that I don't think a lot of people positioned in the equity market are ready for right now. Yeah, I think that's right. And I know Elizabeth has some thoughts on this, but what's what's really fascinating about this instrument historically, you know, in terms of in times of turmoil, geopolitical risks, there's a flock to US bonds, which obviously makes yields go lower. And I think to a certain extent, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is probably you know, that's added to the move lower in yields. And then today you have these huge cross currents, right? I mean, the geopolitical risks are being ratcheted up. I mean, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but people watch the news, they see what's going on. So in one regard, you should have yields lower. And then the flip side of the coin is you got some Fed minutes. We're going to look at that slide. You know, there's this concern that maybe what's with going on and this re potential reacceleration of inflation, yields go higher. So we are at a crossroads, but you, know, we put, you put on a trade the other day that sort of encompass the TLT. I thought it could get down to 95. I think it got down to 97 on the screws or so today ish. Maybe 97.15 was the low. And that worked out pretty well. But the bond market, I still think, Elizabeth, is key to this entire thing. Yep. So we are starting to do this. Everybody notices here on a Wednesday, not a Thursday. Yeah. 
We're doing that. We're going to preview my note, which will still drop on Thursday mornings, but I write them on Wednesday mornings. And there is a section in that note called Who Knows First? And it's basically a question of the idea that's been longstanding that bonds know things before equities know things. Is that still the case? And if that is the case, should we be paying more attention to bonds? Are they sending a signal that inflation is going to reaccelerate? Or are they sending a signal that we should listen a little bit more closely to the Fed and stop baking in three cut, or, I'm sorry, six cuts this year because they continue to send this hawkish message. And there's a message out there today that was we may not be done with hikes. So I think the bonds are going to hold the key this year. I made that point in the note as well that the 10 year Treasury yield is something that is a big question to be answered. It's down 100 basis points since the end of October. That's a huge move. And a move down in treasuries, usually, especially the 10-year treasury, not a good sign. So certainly something that we have to look at as a contradiction to most of the narratives that are out there. So it's interesting, guys. So while we're still looking at this one-year chart, we did not spend a lot of time above four and a quarter percent. No. You know what I mean? No. So so it's interesting that, you know, again, Guy, to your point about how, you know, yields and stocks acting in tandem. So the one period this year that we had that 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 proper 10% sell-off, you know, in the S. P 500 came when, when yields like ricocheted from four to 5% or so. So that's the one thing that I just find so curious that, and that at the highs, you had all those higher for longer, Jamie Dimon, be prepared for six, seven, maybe higher. We had Rick Santelli on CNBC on fast money. It might've been to the day guy. And he wasn't saying this and I'm not getting on Rick by any means. And a lot of what he said made a lot of sense. He said in the years to come, be prepared for 10-year yields that could get above 10% or so, maybe as high as 13%. I want to pull up the five-year log chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. And this is really interesting to me, Guy, because that was a bad break, okay? Like, no doubt about it, right? And so it was holding that uptrend, right, that had been in place, you know, from those lows during the pandemic, and we broke. And you could say to yourself, okay, we're through the 200 day. Like this thing is a broken sort of thing. But look at that. If we were to ricochet and get back to that uptrend, which is now resistance, was support, mm -hmm. that's 5%, man. That's right. That's you, exactly you, the way to look at this. You tell card. me. You and, and and listen, you may want to sell those yields with both hands, you know what I mean? If it gets back to five percent, but you tell me where equities are going to be because if we go back to five percent, I think that changes all of the narratives that a lot of folks got comfortable with last year, where yields and stocks could go up together. We've seen the inverse charts of not of the TLT necessarily, but of other instruments, other equities, other indices where you have a break in trend. You have a significant break in trend, uh, and then you have sort of a retest, in this case, of the uptrend line, but that break is still valid effectively. So I, I'm glad you made that point. I mean, you could see yields, and again, over the course of time, that level gets higher and higher and an uptrend line. So you could see, the theoretically, yields go back to sort of four and three quarters, 5%, and still have broken this trend line that you drew. And to your point, and I know Elizabeth has thoughts. I have no idea what equities do. I mean, I think I do, yeah. but I really don't understand what equities would think in the face of that. Obviously, I'll tell you this, that little move to the upside in yields today, the market didn't particularly like. So I guess it stands to reason that if we were to have a move of that magnitude, equities would not like that at all. So, so Liz, last night on Fast Money, we had Steve Eisman on from Newberger Berman. Okay, mm -hmm. so he was the guy, the big short guy, right? And mm -hmm. he's a brilliant investor. Um, and you know, we've gotten to know him and 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 really appreciate his, um, you know, his thought process in and around yields, especially. And you know, it's interesting. He said one thing that he believes that a lot of the folks in the markets don't believe is that the Fed will not cut three times this year, which is what the Fed dot plot is saying. But the markets are saying something very different. They're saying six potential cuts, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you believe that the Fed is not even going to get to the three cuts this year, mm -hmm. okay, that the dot plots are suggesting, then what's going on? It, 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 does it mean that inflation has not broken, that inflation reemerged? I know this is a theme that Guy had been talking about for the better part of the last half of last year. And I just think that's something where, if that becomes the narrative, just as we had that shoot 
from 4% to 5%, 5% down to 4%, we could have a pretty quick move back higher. I'm just yeah. curious the thoughts on that. Well, I mean, the a lot of that year-end rally was driven on the premise that we had cool CPI in November, cool CPI in December, and then a Fed pivot where they had started to entertain the idea of cuts, which I don't know that they even really said anything like mm -hmm. that, but that's what the market interpreted it as. So then we have this big rally that we ended the year, you know, accounts fat and happy, which I think is a good thing. That's nice to come into the start of a year that way. But it's all predicated on the idea of cuts starting in March, continuing at a steady pace through the end of the year six times. And what I've continued to try to figure out in my head is how do you square that with there being stronger economic data? If that's the thesis, mm -hmm. right? Economic data is strong. Earnings are going to be strong. Inflation is coming down. Why does the Fed have to cut? Why do they have to cut now for sure? Right. There's nothing really telling them that they have to cut. So far, everything seems to be going just fine with rates where they are. So I don't think that they're going to be in any big hurry to do so. And then later in the year, sure, if they want to start normalizing, but they are, I think, pretty terrified to have inflation reaccelerate and deal with yeah. a stagflation situation. Why are people, and Guy, maybe you have some thoughts on this because we didn't get time to talk about it last night. I mean, you know, Fed Chair Powell at that presser just said, we are not going to wait until inflation gets to our yeah. target, you know? And and so that means, and, and I think the person who asked him the question even clarified it, said, so you will start cutting before. And I think, the, you know, the body language was like, yeah, but then you keep hearing this pushback on that since then. What was that, December 13th or so? Um, you know, a lot of pushback where a lot of these Fed heads have come out and just said, so I, listen, this is a tough one. And this amount, Guy, of uncertainty, I think we, you and I know this, is like in, in some of the biggest drivers of, of equity, you know, prices and valuations, yields, if you have this much uncertainty, whatever people are feeling like is the consensus right now is not likely to play out. And that mm -hmm. brings me back to a year ago at this point where everyone was convinced that we we're going to have a recession that didn't come and the stock market ripped. So let me say this, um, because as I mentioned, I do remember a lot of different things. <laughs> Earlier last year, you know, Elizabeth had mentioned that if in fact they move the goalposts, they say that no longer 2% is our target, we can tolerate sort of two and a half, somewhere between two and a half and 3%. The knee-jerk reaction would be higher in stocks, but the the realization that maybe they're saying that because they can't achieve 2% would sort of factor in. And to a certain extent, and I'm sure Liz has some thoughts on this, but I think that's what we're seeing now. The knee-jerk reaction to the comments that you talked about basically a month or so ago, a little less than a month or so ago, was to all clear buy stocks, 2%'s not the bogey anymore. They've moved the goalposts, everything is good. And now maybe there's some... I don't know, maybe they're reconciling the market participants. So wait a second, maybe they're saying that because 2% is unattainable and 25 to 3% is going to be the new normal. And maybe that's one of the reasons you saw the bonds move like they did today. And then throw this in the mix as well. Maybe that's why you saw a 10% move in Bitcoin from sort of 45,000-ish yeah. down to almost 41,000 or so. So all these things are absolutely part and parcel, Dan. Yeah. And I, I do. Re thank you for remembering. I do remember saying that because there was all this speculation about, oh, they're just going to change the target and everything's going to be yeah. OK because we can get to three and that'll be just as good. And you're right. What I originally said was then it'll seem like, OK, we're closer to achieving the goal that they now stated. Right. They just changed the goal and the market would initially react as if that was a good thing. And I think we did get a good reaction to that. But all it does is prove that they maybe don't have the tools and or they can't affect it, right? We know that they can only affect a certain side yeah. of the economic equation. They can't affect everything and they can't control this. The other piece that I think is interesting here is I don't know how stock markets are going to react to most things because they have perplexed me for the last 12 months on, on how investors are actually going to react. But if you think about the, the Fed's projection of where PCE, core PCE and headline PCE will be at the end of this year is 2.4% on both. Yep. So that means not at target. That means above target. They've said instead of moving the target, they've changed it to we just need it to be on a sustainable path toward 2%. So maybe they'll be satisfied somewhere above that. But if if inflation by their measure is above target, then I think that means 10 year yields stay above average. I think that means two year yields mm -hmm. stay above average. And we go back. We have to shift back to this higher for longer narrative, in which case I don't think equity markets are priced for that. I think equity markets are priced for 
going back to the lower narrative, yeah. the lower rates narrative. And that's not but where that's we're headed. That's the amazing point, right? So if long and variable lags of monetary policy, if we haven't seen them yet of the, mm -hmm. of the Fed going from basically zero to five and a half on the upper end of the, the Fed funds rate, then that's why something has to give in 2024, especially given um, all the, I guess, the lack of economic visibility. And one point I want to make, um, and you've written about this, and I know in your note, you were writing about it last year um, in the last few months of the year. And, and Doug Cass um, hits us um, just now. And Doug's been writing about it for a while, too, in his in his column on Real Money, but talking about the equity risk premium. Doug writes, mm -hmm. despite the enormity of the drop in yields, the equity risk premium is still paper thin. And historically, this has been a reasonable predictor of weak markets. The move higher in stocks in 23 was mostly a valuation reset. The specific move in the last two months has entirely been a reset of multiples as the Q4 2023 S&P um, EPS projections are down 4% from the beginning of the fourth quarter of 2024. S&P estimates forecasts are down 1% in the same time frame. And so again, guy, this is like a really important thing. And I think people think that term equity risk premium is, you know, maybe above your pay grade if you're just in there slinging stocks and YOLO and options and doing all that stuff. But it, like to Doug's point, historically, it's been a very good predictor of stocks. And I just want to throw this up before I get your thoughts on this. I mean, look at this chart of the S&P 500. When we talk about how much just got adjusted, mm -hmm. right? Since that pivot. I mean, that is like an epic move in that short period of time. And here we are, we've just broken below uh, that uptrend guy. Yeah, you know what else? And Doug is right, by the way, for pointing that out. And I think with the moving yields, people just assume that those that equity risk premium was going to be a far more favorable than it currently is. But the flip side of the equation is, you know, this multiple expansions to a certain extent, to a certain extent, has mitigated all the movement of bond yields. With that said, another great indicator are things that we talk about, relative strength index and overbought and oversold, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but when they reach levels we haven't seen in a couple of years, when you get north of 80, 82, and on the on the bull side of the equation, I mean, that historically is a pretty, pretty good indicator as well. Another good indicator, and I know Elizabeth has thoughts on this, is the fact that if we get to February, with an inverted yield curve that everybody seemingly has grown tired of talking about, that'll be the longest in history of taking the data. And the longer the inversion, typically the worse or the more severe the slowdown. So there's so many things to be concerned about. Then we have this chart up real quick. I mean, yes, you can say, you know what, that's a very steep uptrend. It was bound to break. Well, here we are. And I'm not suggesting that line is right at all. But if you just think about reversion to the mean, and in this case, reversion to the mean, to the 200 day moving average, which probably at over again, time the cable will come in somewhere between 4375 and 4400. You can start doing the math and understanding where this thing sort of shakes out in terms of the SP 500 potentially over the next couple of weeks, Dan. Uh, just so you know, Guy, I am not tired of talking about yield curve versions. <laughs> That's your gift. For the new year Thank and I put, a, I put a chart of them in every outlook i will still do it i will put a chart of yield curve inversions in every outlook i write until it's over and it's because you can't ignore them and i we've stopped hearing about them because the market went up so suddenly That's it was right. like oh they don't mean anything anymore because look stocks are rising yield curve inversions just must not send a signal it must not send the same signal but the reality is all three of them are still inverted the twos tens the three month tenure and the the feds version, which is the near-term forward spread. What they suggest, and I know we've gone over this ad nauseum, but what they suggest is that short-term rates are going to come down soon. Why do short-term rates come down? Because the Fed cuts rates. And everybody might say, that's absolutely consistent with what the market thinks mm -hmm. is going to happen. And that would be true. But the uninversion, the re-steepening, and we've talked about this, much like it's not the hikes that gets you, it's the cuts. It's not the inversion that gets you, it's the re-steepening. That is usually a really painful transition for markets to go through. We haven't done it yet. We've done it a little bit, right? We've gotten shallower mm -hmm. on some of those inversions, and that typically has not been a good time for markets. The time when we start to break above, I, I don't even know what the shallowest we got was, maybe in the, the low teens, yeah. something like that. I want to say like 15 basis points, but briefly, but yes, yes, yes. So once we get into single digits and we're going to flirt around that that zero or flat line, I think that's when it starts to get really hairy. Yeah, so we're at 41 basis points now. And Liz, you know, the good news is you brought some data here talking about like what happens in in those environments, right? When when they do. Mm -hmm. So let, let's mm -hmm. throw this up. So this is a preview of your Outlook note that drops tomorrow on the SoFi Investing blog 
people, you guys know where uh, to sign up for that and get it right into your inbox. And we're really excited to actually do a little preview action it's on fun. Wednesdays in 2024. Yeah. Let's talk about this a, a little. Oh, there it is, right? SoFi.com slash blog. Um, and you That's can sign up for this. That's a tic-tac-toe board, by the way, Dan. Yeah, who's winning? Somebody won already. Oh, Circle won. gets the square. Yeah. Yeah. Guy, guy is excellent at that game, by the way. <laughs> um, so it's a, let, let's throw this data up here a little bit because this is something that we, we've talked a lot about over the last, call it 25 years or so, you know, when the Fed starts to cut after that long pause. It's a, kind of that, that anticipation of the pause and then mm -hmm. that period between the pause and the hiking and the cutting that's good mm -hmm. for stocks. But it's, it's your point about the re-steepening of the yield curve, right? Or the re, uh, you know, and, and then uh, when they start to cut, that's not good for stocks. So right. talk to us a little bit about these scenarios. I'm actually, yeah, I'm going to start with this yeah. one. Thank you. So this table, this goes back to our conversation on the tenure. I know there's a lot to look at here, so I'll summarize it very easily for you. If you can look on the right side, the colors of red or green, you don't see a lot of green. Those are just boxes telling you that typically in the time between the last hike and the first cut, the 10-year yield usually falls. The only boxes that are green are times when it's risen, okay? Now, also, we know that between the last hike and the first cut, the market, the stock market tends to do pretty well. And then once the cuts start is usually when you see a sell-off in the market, a recession starts, maybe there's a bottom that happens. I think it's about three to 12 months afterwards on average. So the general experience here in this period is that the 10-year yield should fall usually on the heels of cooling economic data. If you look at the last line in this table, that's the current experience. We haven't gone six months yet since that last hike, but close enough, and the 10-year yield is up, okay? Then you might say to me, well, it's not the first time that's ever happened. Look at 1974. The 10-year yield was up three months out, six months out, 12 months out from that last hike. So it's not impossible. You'd be correct, it's not impossible, but the scenario that was occurring in 1974 CPI was over 10% and continuing to rise. That was actually in the middle of a recession. We were smack dab in the middle of a recession during that period, and oil prices had risen. The economy was dealing with stagflation. I would argue we don't want to repeat that scenario whatsoever. So the only thing that you can expect in this type of scenario, if we're headed for some kind of soft landing, what everybody believes, you want yields to come down. You want this to look it more normal. And right now it doesn't look normal. So this is something that tells me the bond market believes the Fed more than it believes the equity market. And it believes that inflation is still a risk. It's interesting. You know, I'll tell you, because I was around back then, 1974. <laughs> I mean, that came on the heels of, and, and we've talked about this ad nauseum as well. The mistakes that were made in the early 70s manifested themselves. And again, the spring into the summer of 1974, when the Fed basically declared victory over inflation, only to have it come raging back, which is why Elizabeth points out 74 uh, to this magnitude, because inflation, which they thought had been slayed, came back in spades, which is one of the reasons I've been saying, Dan, for a while, that I thought this Fed would remain hawkish, not wanting to make the same mistakes that were made in the early 1970s. Yeah, no, and again, that seemed to be the narrative in into the last you know week or two of the year after that Fed presser, and it really kind of threw a little uh, oil, uh, if you will, on the fire of the of the stock market because a lot of like Fed speakers were kind of pushing back on that notion. Um, and again, he does not want to be um, the guy who who let inflation was wrong and transitory, and then did what he thought he needed to do, but then kind of let it reemerge. Um, and again, you know, the politics of this year are going to be really interesting too, if you think about it, right, in election year um, and the like. So um, who knows? You know, one of the things I thought was really interesting looking at my main fact set screen today is that a lot of these, um, you know, industrials, a lot of financially oriented, they're just getting hit really hard. And still, they were getting hit hard when yields were up, but they actually haven't moved a lot since we've seen that reversal guy a little bit. I mean, we could just kind of throw up, let's throw up the XHB, let's throw up home builders. They've had this sort of epic run. Um, you know, like, like, look at that, you know, like that's a big break over the last couple of trading days. Thought, thoughts on home yeah, builders because some of the data know, has not been great over the last couple mortgage of Mortgage applications, you know, yeah. Elizabeth studies this stuff as well. I mean, the data suggests that things are not as rosy as the stocks would make them to appear. I think to a certain extent, the move in the bond market obviously hurt this. But your point about industrials, I mean, the manufacturing data that we've seen, you know, mm -hmm. we saw some numbers lower today has not been good. So it all makes sense in terms of, you know, what's going on in the broader market. And again, the tug of war 
is manifesting itself in the bond market with slowing data clearly. I mean, leading economic indicators down 18, 19 months in a row, which theoretically should mean yields in 10 years should continue to fall. The flip side of that equ equation is, in fact, you know, inflation going to rear its ugly head and some of these other things. You have the geopolitical risk going on, which to a certain extent should make yields fall. But on the flip side of the equation, it could be very inflationary given what's going on. So there's a lot to decipher here. But I'll say this, that home builder chart absolutely scares me a little bit. And you see the gaps on the downside and we're looking at it right now. I mean, it's not unrealistic to think this could be a low 80s, high 70s instrument over the next couple of weeks. I have a question for both of you. So we have this massive rally through the end of the year. The narrative was most people thought that it could extend through the end of the year. I don't think there were a lot of people on the other side of that calling for a huge drawdown before December 31st. And the rest of the narrative was, and then we probably are due for a breather January, February. So is some of this just a breather or is this actually, I mean, can we look at these charts and say this is more concerning than than just a breather? Well, you know what's really, Guy, and I, I you know, we didn't hit on this last night um, when we were talking about that Apple downgrade by by Barclays. And, and listen, to be fair, the guy went from a neutral to a sell, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, the stock, you know, had just made a new all-time high, what, a week or two ago or something like that. I thought it was interesting because he did it on January 2nd. You know what I mean? Like, and, and so he didn't want to upset the Apple cart for all those folks who've been loading up into those names. What, what's that? No pun intended. Yeah. Well, I didn't, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that one. People. You're so clever. No, but, you but, can't but, help yeah, it. Yeah, I can't help it. Um, but, but you know, it's the same mentality of a lot of investors, right? Like you right. So we're like, I got these gains. I, it's up 50%. I'm not going to sell this year. Although I want to sell. Cause I also think that other people are going to sell next year because they don't want to pay taxes this year you know it's the same crap right like so it, you know it's interesting to me like of course it was going to happen especially when you had the sort and i don't say like that like i like i knew and i had some big trade on you know what i mean to take it but just from a pundit standpoint it just makes perfect sense guy and i i do think it was kind of cute how that analyst did that on the first trading day of the year yeah and you know i'll say this as well da davidson came out yesterday i think about 4 45 ish um and i think with a neutral and apple 100 and $65 price target to the downside. I think the consensus price target, according to fact set for Apple is 198 or so. But, you know, I know we're not going Apple specific here, but your point is well taken. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we've talked about this over and over and over again. You know, when Apple makes new all time highs, which it's, it's what that's its want to do. You know, you'll hear the own it, don't trade it mantra come out. And I understand that. And if you've just closed your eyes and bought it, 15, 20 years ago and woke up today, you'd be very happy. But what I also point out, and if, if Stephen or Jacob can do a longer term chart, I think Stephen's doing the charts today, you know, go back five years and you've seen significant drawdowns in this name. By the way, significant drawdowns in an environment where the stock was trading, in some cases, half the valuation that it's trading at today with probably twice the growth rate that you have today. So yeah. the paradox around yeah. Apple here is interesting in a word, but I'll also say this, and I mentioned it yesterday, I mentioned it all the time. The biggest winner, the biggest beneficiary of passive investing without question is Apple. As then we pointed it out how many hundreds of different ETFs and funds have Apple as their top 10 to 15 holdings. So in a world where money flows into the market, Apple is going to succeed. Of course, the problem is the times when money starts to come out, that's when Apple falters. And we might be on the precipice of this now, Dan. By the way, we are approaching that moving average, which we traded down to in October and bounced off of. Yeah. And, and I guess, Liz, I'll throw it back to you a little bit. I mean, we just showed, um, you know, the chart of, of the XHB. Let's pull up the IYR. This is real estate. OK, mm -hmm. like, look at this. The same sort of this went from a one of the worst performing right ETFs, um, you know, to one of the best in, in a very short period of time, very near its 52 week highs, you know, just, just a week and a half ago here, you see that uptrend, you see that lonely 200 day moving average down there. I'm not asking you to opine on the chart, but if all of these, and let's, let's pull up the, uh, the KRE for a second. Okay. So the regional banking index, if all of these sectors love that move from 5% to 4% in the 10 year yield, mm -hmm. or obviously lower, you know, it, it stands like you tell me what are people waiting for? Because I, I'd be yeah. looking to clip any of these right here. Yeah, I agree. And well, I mean, I'll, I'll comment on the chart for sure. I think it's pretty clear that we saw the move down in yields. 
people expecting mortgage rates to come down. And there've been a lot of people sitting around not wanting to go home shopping because mortgage rates were so high. And funny enough, it was 8%. If it comes down to 7%, it sounds like a bargain. Mm -hmm. And then you've got people going back into the market. So some of that's happening. That's going to also be a tailwind for regional banks. You've got increased lending activity mm -hmm. and the expectation of that coming up. And obviously the lowered unrealized losses that then would show up on regional bank balance sheets, um, that would be a tailwind as well. Here's one of the, the risks. There's some event risk in yields and in what's going on in regional banks. And I actually... For the most part, I'm actually pretty positive on financials this year. We can talk about that at a different time. Mm -hmm. But um, if you think about, let's say yields do start to creep back up, right? And then we've got this unrealized losses concern that comes back into play and, oh, maybe it's not solved. The bank term funding program expires in March. Now, that's going to end up being a really political thing, mm -hmm. I think. And they're, both sides of the aisle are going to do whatever they can to keep us out of recession because they don't want that on their clock. But that is supposed to expire in March. If we are at a point where some of those happen at the same time, yields start to creep back up, the market doesn't like it, unrealized losses start to look bigger again, and the funding program expires, I think you've got a pretty risky situation uh, in the regional banking industry again. Guy, are you, um, you know, we had, again, going back to Steve Eisman being on with us last night, um, you know, a guy, he doesn't seem... Um, you know, he doesn't seem particularly negative on the banks. He seems, as the kids say, a little bit meh, you know, even after the big rally or so. And and so, you know, I think the lack of clarity about the economy clearly expected downshift in the U.S. economy, you know, uh, in 2024. And then this kind of really uncertain picture about where the market is on yields, right? And, and what might likely happen. I think it makes banks much harder from here. And look at this KRE really quickly. You mentioned this, I think, on Market Call um, last week or so. I mean, that breakout above those kind of levels, right, where things were getting a little funky, right, in the regional banking land back in the spring, that's that's pretty meaningful. I mean, we're consolidating here. You know what I mean? It feels like a lot of investors kind of just kind of held their nose and, and they bought here and it would take some meaningful move in yields or some economic data or something for them to kind of really, um, you know, kind of sell these too hard. Yeah, I guess. it's it's interesting. I think to a certain extent, the regional banks, in the absence of bad news, um, they were just going to sort of levitate on a valuation play, which, again, you can make a very compelling case for so many of these names on valuation. The problem, of course, is the environment that they find themselves in, credit contracting, obviously these bigger banks sort of dominating the landscape. I think it's a more difficult environment for some of these regional banks. And I don't think these moves to the upside have taken that into consideration at all. So if you do see unemployment, this is just my opinion, but if you do see the unemployment rate tick higher in a nonlinear way, I think that these, these names are going to be under significant pressure. With that said, real quick, if you want to put up a JP Morgan chart, because why not? And if you do it over the last sort of three years, you will see that I want to say, JP, I know it made a 52-week high yesterday. It may have made an all-time high. So you can go back and look at the chart. Uh, that's a pretty significant level here. Now, the Bulls have absolutely uh, acquitted themselves extraordinarily well over the last couple of weeks in JP Morgan. But now you have to really prove yourself because if we stall here, obviously a lot of the armchair technicians are going to talk about this potential for a double top, Dan. Yeah. So I mentioned JP Morgan because that's obviously – the, the top of the shit yeah. pile. Let, 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 let's, let's leave that up for a second. And so what's really interesting to me is that go and think back to what was going on there the last time. It was consolidating for months near those all-time highs. So it made a new all-time high. It was consolidating. There was a lot of volatility. It was holding its moving average. I mean, there was a whole host of things going on. Think about now. Think about how far this stock has come in such a short period of time. Think of the relative outperformance to its, you know, to its peers and the like here. This new high that it briefly touched does not have any of the authority that that last high did from a year or two years ago, like that sort of thing, in my opinion, because it's just gone up in a straight line. And so if you caught this move at any point over the last six months or so, it, the first sign of any sort of distress, you're out of this thing, man. Like, 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 you know what I mean? Like, I, so that's kind of my two cents. So Liz, I'm just curious how you think about it because, you know, like somebody upgraded Citigroup the other day and, you know, this thing trades and guy made the point on fast money last night at a premium to its tangible, um, you know, book value where city and bank traded discounts to them. I, I think you stick with the quality, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know why you'd be chasing those other ones right here. Well, there were, there were more than one that, 
upgraded city the other day. Yeah. And and that's a completely different story. I think there's actually going to be a, a quite a bit of divergence in these big banks. They traded together after the regional banking crisis. Many of them benefited mm -hmm. from that. And now they're not trading together anymore. You're having a very different experience depending on which one of the big five you own. And I think in, in 2024, some of the the reasons that I'm positive on financials are not for the the same things that have driven JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. There's part of it is a little bit of that where you think about the idea of, okay, if we make it through the first half of the year and economic fundamentals stay solid and the Fed cuts rates maybe once or at least hints at it, we get, you know, yields fall further, then you've got a re-steepening of the yield curve. You've got NIM that's more attractive without a without an economic contraction, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be positive for cyclicals, positive for banks. When you look through the rest of the year, we've talked about this. I, I know I've mentioned it quite a bit. There's been this heat up in M&A activity. Mm -hmm. And so far, it hasn't been so much financial M&A. It's been more strategic M&A. But if that M&A cycle continues to heat up and turns into financial M&A, guess what they need in order to conduct M&A? They need capital markets. Yep. So some of the ones that have those product lines, I think, can benefit in that environment, too. So you do have to be choosy about which financials you own. Um, but that being said, the other part of it is that you got this catch-up trade, and if last year was such a great year for tech and for the NASDAQ, yeah. if we do have a drawdown, the stuff on the other side of it that does well is things like financials, small caps, industrials, right? You want to have that stuff and find your position. Oh, there's when you plenty of pent-up demand for IPOs and and M&A and, <clears throat> and, and, and leverage loan, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I, I agree with that. At some point, I just think the ba the banks might be discounting a bit of that now after yeah. such a short period of move. Guy, yeah. I just want to make one last point here before we get to the questions. Um, So it's not just things that were working that have been sold the last couple of days in 2020. Pull up, um, if, if they could pull up the Nike chart for a second, because this stock, looked like a lot of the other ETFs that we just talked about. It looked like a lot of these other names over the last couple of months. It went from a 52 week low, you know, going up. I don't know. This stock went from like 90 to 125 over a couple of months. Look at this thing after that huge gap, after that earnings and guidance that disappointed, it's selling off today. If we want to pull up the XRT, the retail um, ETF, not trading particularly well um, again. So like I just today, and, and you could draw that steep uptrend. I just wanted to highlight that. But the last thing, after a couple really bad days um, in, in tech, look at what's green right now on my screen. Um, Alphabet's green, Microsoft's green. Um, so there's a couple mega cap tech stocks that, again, I just wonder, guy, are they going to come back to those after they've clipped them enough? And you just you laid out the level in Apple. If it went down, I don't know, another five, 10 bucks or so, it's trading at that 200 day or something like that. Not bad support, taking a couple turns off that multiple. What's happened, and you know this, and EY knows this as well, when, in the times of market sell-offs, people have found solace and they found comfort and they found value in a lot of these high growth, high valuation tech names for a myriad of different reasons. A lot of them have huge moats around their businesses. We acknowledge that. Great balance sheets and the ability to sort of weather storms where other companies can't. So to answer your question, since that's what's happened historically, there's no reason to believe that's not going to happen again. However... There is also an environment where those stocks start, start get taken out to the woodshed on the back of people saying, you know what, valuations have reached levels that we sort of can't wrap our head around. And if there's a broader market sell-off, Dan, I don't think they're going to be spared at all. So I think, you know, you're right to point them out without question, but- you know, that's going to be the ultimate tell when yeah. those start to give it up a little bit. Well, listen, just today, I mean, this is worth noting, Liz, the the, the uh, equal weight S&P, the RSP is down 1% and the market cap weighted SPX is down a half a percent. So mm -hmm. like, you know, if everyone got really excited over the last couple of weeks about the broadening out of the rally and less of the reliance on the MAG-7, you better watch out for this because if you lose a lot of those other things and we become increasingly dependent to your point guy about you know those names that got us there in 2023, that is going to get long in the tooth a little bit. All right, guy, you ready You ready to go off the rails? I'm ready. A little I'm, well, I'm always ready to go off the rails. And I'm going to start with a question for Elizabeth. You ready? Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you don't have to prepare for this question. You're going to okay. know it intuitively. This is from DJ Chapman. Hello, DJ. How stoked is EY for Packer versus Bears for the playoffs? Winner apparently oh. gets in. I mean, that's pretty interesting. Look, nice picture, by the way, DJ. Yeah, uh, so stoked. Scale from 1 to 10, I'd say a 12. We have a song. There's a Packer song called The Bears Still Suck. 
That's going to be played around the state of Wisconsin. There's a Packer bar in New York City called Kettle of Fish. They play it like every five minutes in there, and it's going to be on full blast. I, that's It's going to be a great game. I hope it's a great game. I hope it's a good game to watch. Obviously, I hope we come out victorious. And there is no team that I think the Packers would rather beat oh, to yeah. get into the playoffs, to solidify their spot in the playoffs but, than the Bears. But, Guy, this is a question for you now. So the Bears have that that pick, right? And yeah. so what what is just – what what is Justin Fields playing for? So the the Bears quarterback, because a lot of folks think that that Bears Caleb... are going to trade. The Bears are going to trade that. I'm telling you right now, the Bears are going to trade out of one. I think they I think they'll figure. I think Justin Fields can be a top twelve to fifteen quarterback in the NFL. So I think what you're going to see, the Bears who have the first and second pick in the draft, are probably going to trade one of those picks. They're going to get probably draft equity in the back end. You're going to see them. I think they're going to get really fat. They potentially could get the tight end from Georgia, the Bowers kid, who's a stud, Joe Alt, who is a player at tackle. You could see them draft him. So I'm not convinced the Packers are going to draft a quarterback. Excuse me, the Bears are going to draft a quarterback here. That's All me, right. Dan. All Anybody right, guy. I got I got one for you here. Um, this is from wait. This is from Todd, and and, and I can't see. It's Widenfeller. Widenfeller. That's a, that's a good handle. I mean, Todd Weidenfelder. <laughs> um, hi, guy. Jet Blue before earnings was a buy. Should I stay in or go? Thank you and happy. Hey, Todd Weidenfeller is wishing you a happy new year on Jan 3. And you can at least do the same for him. Okay. Yeah. Or I can say GFY, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> HNY. HNY. <laughs> The move in JetBlue, I think it got almost, to, I want to say, six bucks at the end of December, and now it's trading sub five. So, you know, Tim Seymour talks about this all the time. These airlines are absolute trading stocks, and unfortunately, I thought there was probably more room in JetBlue to the upside. It's a name that I mentioned, I want to say, into December of this of last year on the show, and I thought it probably had room, you know, north of seven bucks. That didn't play out. Question is, where do you get back in? Because I do think there's going to be some noise in the space as well. Um, obviously, if there's a slowdown, airlines are not going to like it. If crude oil gets back on its source, geopolitical. But there's also going to be some consolidation in the space. So, Todd, I think if you can get it to a level where, you know, 463 or so, and you can go back and look, that was the level, I think, on December 1st. I think you want to try to buy the stock there for a trade. Uh Okay, interesting. It, it is interesting today with crude oil up. Maybe they can flash up the crude chart, Liz. Um, thoughts here, Guy and I have been talking about it a lot over the last couple of weeks. It's kind of grinding in the, 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 around the 70 sort of level here. It's trying to, what, what is your, help break a tie. We've been talking about this a little bit. So on days, and, and again, back to that kind of trading you know, of, of the airlines, they seem to be very sensitive to price of crude, which is kind of odd, a little bit to me, given the fundamentals um, right now. Thoughts on crude here? It, not a great looking chart. Pretty well defined downtrend has been in. Is it more? Is it supply demand dynamics? Is it supply dynamics? Is it demand dynamics? What's going on? Is it China? Like what, what's the deal here with crude? I think it's more supply dynamics than demand, especially with everything that went on towards the end of the year. And we had this cyclical type rally and the idea that the economy was going to be strong and the global economy was going to muscle through. Looking at this chart from a distance, this is a, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to be kind of a doomsdayer, but it's a pretty recessionary looking chart. You know, you had that spike, you usually see oil spike before recession. And then you have a pretty decided downtrend, just falling off and not being able to find its way back up. Even with the expectation of refilling the strategic petroleum mm -hmm. reserves, there have been cuts in supply. It still couldn't find some good upside. So I think this is something definitely to watch, but it's hovering in a zone that says, there are concerns about demand. It's hovering in a zone that says it's not consistent with the cyclicality signals that the market is sending. However, if it does go back up, let's say a shock takes it back up, something happens with supply. I don't think that's necessarily a good sign for demand either. I think that's a bad mm -hmm. sign for inflation. Guy, your final trade last night. I mean, so you don't really care that much about oil down here for your positive views on many oil stocks that you're looking at. Is that fair? Yeah, it is fair. And, you know, I think ExxonMobil was my final trade yesterday. I think it's up, you know, marginally today. But if you look, we throw up an XLE chart, which I think XLE is trading around 85 and change or so. I mean, believe it or not, it's actually held in yeah. decently well. Now, if you go back longer term and look at this, you'll see what I'm talking about. I mean, yes, it's sold off, but 
you know what? If you look at this chart, I mean, you've seen things fall off a cliff and this is sort of hanging in. So I do think the XLE, regardless of crude price, unless we obviously have a 50 handle, I think there's going to be, I think people are going to be surprised by how well the equities have done. And quite frankly, they've held, they've held in there rather well, Dan. Well, you know what? This one could be teeing up, guy, in the new year for a little options trade. So maybe stay tuned on the market call. Uh, implied volatility, the price of options in the XLE looks really reasonable, especially when you consider Exxon and Chevron. What are they, about 40% of the weight of the XLE? I like that consolidation in and around that 200-day, and I like the fact that it doesn't really mind how crude trades so heavy right here. So um, that could be interesting. All right, here's a question, guy. This is right up your alley. Um, I think this is, this is JS. I'm, I'm assuming... It's our super fan, fan Jay Sloan, uh, who is always tuning in, and we appreciate all of his uh, feedback. DC-based defense contractor, GD, that's General Dynamics, mm -hmm. seems uh, right industry for the times, hitting all-time highs, but not a crazy valuation. Stay long and strong, guy. Yeah, if you pull up a chart here, you'll see we traded up to the levels we saw, I think, in November of 2022, if I'm not mistaken. I think we probably surpassed that. I think this 261 print today was an all-time high in general dynamics. But, you know, these are, again, all these stocks have had tremendous runs for obvious reasons. You know this, Dan, because you're sitting next to me forever here on Fast Money. I've talked about defense stocks mm -hmm. seemingly forever. Lockheed Martin's been the one name that I talk about, but general dynamics has been another. If you can sort of stomach a little, you know, five to ten dollar move to the downside, which is nothing in the context of this, yes, the answer is you stay with these names. Valuation still makes sense. You do see pullbacks along the way, but you do not give up on defense stocks. I've said this as well. Gandhi could be defense secretary in the United States or president of the United States, and defense spending would still continue to go higher. And all these names went to it. You can pull up a Textron chart, TXT. I think that made an all-time high as well. So, yes, you stay with the entire complex. You're going to love this chart. There you go. So they, they yeah, all look very that, similar. That is, that is a beautiful chart. And I'll tell you, last night um, in the Wall Street Journal, or I guess it came out um, late, uh, early this morning, Liz, very dark article. Um, mm. The West badly needs more missiles but the wait to buy them is years long. And it's basically talking about the defense industry and talking about how, you know, what's gone on, uh, you know, obviously in, in Europe and, and whatever happens as a result, if Ukraine continues to grind out or if, if Russia prevails, you know, there's going to be pressure on NATO to build up kind of either way guy, right? Like, like if you think about that, you think about what's gone on in the middle East and the potential for that to be a wider war. They obviously mentioned China and Taiwan. There's that article. Take a read on that. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's you know we hate talking about um you know investing in things like this some people don't even look to do that or whatever but these guys are not all just defense contractors to make other things thoughts on uh, on a space like that because it feels like it, it seems specific when there's bombs dropping people ask about them and they don't ask when there's uh peace in the world well, has there ever been peace no, in the world sadly. i don't think it's on the horizon so that's people. part of what keeps this industry alive yeah. Other thing to keep in mind, there are there are two big industries that get affected in election year. Defense is one of them. Healthcare is the other. But if you think about what might happen this year, if you have a change of control, uh, if you have Republicans come into the White House, if you even a, just a change of control in Congress, defense stocks likely get affected by that. So um, this is definitely something to keep an eye on for the rest of the year. I would agree with Guy, although it is it is a weird, it's almost a perverse thing to talk about investing in. It feels like you're supporting such efforts um and you're not really but anyway yeah since world peace is not on the horizon Dang. i think these companies stay in business and an election year makes the movements more interesting yeah i'm with liz on that and you know again we try to take politics out of the equation but these names i mean they are all pretty much lower left upper right hugh hadley anyone notice i know dan has noticed this oracle falling apart hit 125 not too long ago now flirting with 100 the short answer is this Stock was off to the races into that earnings release. And then obviously you saw that precipitous drop in the shares. I have a chart that I'm looking at, but Stephen or Jacob can pull up one as well. It has a huge level of support, right? Basically where we are. If you go back and look uh, one year. over the last one year, yeah, one year yeah. is exactly right. The level that we traded down to in October, uh, I think $100 and maybe 40 cents ish. And then the level we just traded down to in early December of last year, the same thing. It does not appear like it wants to hold it. 
But that's your absolute line in the sand here, Dan. Valuation is reasonable, but you know what? People don't seem to care about valuation right well, now. Well, that's that's the point there, guy. To see those two gaps that we've had over the last two quarters, significant gaps, 10% plus gaps. This is not a small company, right? That's on a disappointing result in guidance. After that prior quarter, if you go back to the spring where the stock gapped to a new all-time high, you know, like this is this company's a roll up just plain and simple, right? So when you talk about trading at a market multiple about 18 and a half times on expected you know, earnings growth of high single digits and high single digits expected sales growth, um, it's just the only way they get growth is by buying big companies. You know what I mean? And so to me, I don't know. I, I just don't find it particularly compelling. I kind of feel like the best trade, and I've been really consistent about this, you know, for the last couple of years, I keep saying, you know, like if you're interested in tech, the QQQ is just the dollar cost average. Just, just do that every day, every week, every month, whatever the heck it is. You know what I mean? Like, listen, I love YOLOing tech stocks. I love trying to short them. I like trying to buy puts or put spreads or this. Or I don't always do it successfully, but like getting outperformance in tech is really hard. I mean, you could say, oh, look at NVIDIA. It was up 230% last year. All you had to do is buy listen, every step of the way that that trade gets harder and harder. And then we just want to pull up the underperformance of um, NVIDIA since that gap in the spring. I mean, that thing's been grinding. You know, you know what I mean? So you tell me, maybe that's bullish. Maybe there's another like, I'm not certain about that on a relative basis, not particularly great. So I look at going back to an Oracle, there's just guy, there's nothing exciting there. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like you tell me what they're going to buy next. And the next thing they do is probably something that's really expensive, Liz, like in the data center or something around Gen AI or whatever. And it, it, and it might be um, it might be a weight around the shoulders of, of Oracle if you think about it, because it, it might not be uh, accretive to earnings, if you will. Yeah, well, I mean, usually, you know, you see price movements when when there are consolidations like that, but you don't want to do it when the market has just come off of an absolutely fiery rally because yeah. things are inflated and you're, you might overpay. Uh, and the market will tell you whether or not they think you overpaid for something pretty yeah. quickly. Um, so, I mean, I think the M&A cycle is going to be really interesting this year. I think it's going to be really interesting in tech. I think it's going to be interesting in media. Uh, and I think it might even be interesting in financials if something happens with some of those smaller banks. Yeah. And Guy, just one last point in this, and we'll take one more question. Um, but uh, you know, this is not the sort of market that you want to be buying things like we pulled right. up that Nike chart before. You know what I mean? The ones that have actually confirmed that they have the headwinds that gave the negative guidance. You can say, oh, well, that was conservative. When you have two gaps like that in a row, like in this Oracle chart, you you really want to wait and see what happens next a little bit. So I just don't think this is the sort of market, depending upon your time horizon, if you have a long-term time horizon, fine. You know what I mean? But it's not the sort of market I think you want to be buying names that are broken like this. Somebody that's been with us from the beginning, matrix of compassion for you, Dan. Do you set a percentage limit to your total account value when you play options? Some traders Ooh. have a maximum of 3 to 5% in active options at any given time. Thank you. That's a good-looking picture. That's a handsome, bald man right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Matrix of compassion. Um, This is a really great question. And I think it really depends what you're trying to do with options within your portfolio, right? So if you have a portfolio that you just generally buy and hold, and you might use options, um, let's say to leverage existing names, you know, in into an event, or maybe use them for yield enhancement by selling calls against them. And I know, I think, I think what you're asking is, is like, if I look at my investable assets, what percentage of the portfolio should I be dedicating to options trading? I think I think it really should come down to your conviction on the ideas and what is the impetus for you to use options, right? If you say to yourself, well, I'm long a lot of Microsoft and I just cannot get myself to buy any more because it's a disproportionate part of my portfolio, but I really think they're going to have a beat and raise when they report next week. The idea of dedicating, let's say, a small amount of your portfolio to give you leverage on that existing position, right? That makes sense to me, right? So I think about options use in three main reasons. One is yield enhancement against things you own, selling calls, taking in some premium. The other one is obviously leverage um, and speculation, but you better be disciplined on that front. And then the last one is obviously for protection, whether it's individual position protection um, or portfolio protection. So I don't have a clear answer to that question. I don't think there is one. It really depends on what your objectives are in the markets. We've got one more question from Scott about U-Haul. And this is actually, I pulled this chart up, but Scott's asking my question, would we, if we see an unfreezing of the housing market, 
Uh, what do you think of U-Haul? Chart doesn't look great at the moment, but it's a long time hold. Well, it doesn't look great because you're basically at a prior all time high. And we've had this huge run up. You know, I was looking at um, some of the comments on Twitter about U-Haul earlier. And apparently there's been, again, Dan hates this, but some very active call buying in the name. If we could even go out a little longer term, you know, you'll see where this stock is now and where it's been historically. But this has had a huge run, and we're right up against those levels again that we saw in the fall of 2021. You mirrored the same high we basically made in early 2023. Uh, this is my inclination, Scott. If you've enjoyed the ride, which you clearly have, there's nothing wrong with pulling the ripcord here and looking for a pullback potentially to the moving average, which we've sort of trans we've tra traversed a number of different times over the last year, year and a half or so. So my inclination is. Look for a better – take some money off the table. Look for a better entry point. The better entry point comes in right around the moving average, Dan. Wow. Guy, that, I didn't even know U-Haul was a publicly traded company. Did you know I that? I did not know that. Oh, there you um, yeah. You know, so last last thing, let's like, kind of bookend this Q&A. This was fun, actually. Like, we should do this more often. Okay. I, I really enjoyed that. All right. Um, do teams with the records of, of the Packers and the Bears deserve to be in the NFL playoffs, hey. guy? Come on. No, I mean that. Listen, I'm a Bears well, fan. No, I'm going okay? like, to answer that question. I mean, card. historically, you know, there was, I think Seattle got in a wild card a few years ago before the 17 game season. They were like, I want to say it was some absurd record, like seven and nine or something. Mm -hmm. And they got in, they actually won a game in the playoffs. So people say, see that? They won a game. But this is where I stand. If you're if you're less than 500, you do not deserve. I don't give a shit yeah. whether you won the division or not, or won your. You should not be allowed in the playoffs. And by the way, when there are 43 friggin' bowl games in college football, I mean, are you kidding me? I can do that math. That means 86 teams. Stop it. You're embarrassing yourself. So no Whoa. to answer your question. Uh, All right. Well, Liz, I can agree with that. Below 500, but the Packers are eight and eight, so yeah. I'm good. Yeah, so to, to to get to the playoffs, they need to be nine and eight. So fair enough. No, but they're not below. Yeah, they're at. I, listen, guy, you must like that that young quarterback in um in Green Bay. Like you like Fields, you know? Like yeah, like I they, do. They, I think they, he's they, gonna they, figure it out as well. Yeah. I mean, people mm -hmm. forget Phil Sims. I think got drafted in like 1980, 81. He didn't play for like four years. Now it was a different time. I get it, <laughs> but it takes time to develop. Not everybody is Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow. I mean, it does take time to develop into a top tier quarterback. And I think love has everything he needs. He just needs a little bit of a team around him, but I think he's going to be unshackled next year. I think he's going to figure it out. I think you can be surprised by the growth you see in that young quarterback as well. Dan. Wow. All right, we I think it. he's done well. Yeah, I you're happy about well. him. I yeah. know you're happy, yeah, but you I were mean, happy to see your boy Rogers leave. Well, sure. Um, I don't want to do anything on a hot mic about no. that right now, but no. I, I think all of Wisconsin is behind him, you know, yeah. behind love. And I think, well, I think all of Chicago nice is behind see. fields. Okay. So no, let's see how this plays out. All right. Well, suck. we will, all right, you guys, listen, you guys know where to find Liz's blog. Here's the cool thing. We're going to do previews of it on Wednesdays on market call. So check it out. SoFi.com slash blog guy take us out man this was, that was fun. fun thanks for the questions we had a lot of questions we were not able to get to that's because i have to get my ass in a car and go to new york city for cnbc's fast money but obviously thanks elizabeth for being here so five facts that all the sponsors the audience yes we will take questions more often in 2024 we love the engagement and we will see you tomorrow when the great carter braxton worth joins us see you later see you later